It didn't work that time. Is this on? This is... Somebody's been playing with the mic. There we go. Hi. Welcome. Tonight's trivia night. Oh, yay. I hope you've been working on your team names. We have shuttles ready to get you four to five people on a team. If you don't have one, we'll arrange one when you get there. Um, we'll be at the tavern if anybody's walking right after this. We'll take shuttles down there. Um, if you've still got your packet on you, everybody should have a coupon for the tavern in your packet too, so bring that with you. Tomorrow is the day we flip the schedule. <laughs> It's also the day we let you sleep in just a little bit. Breakfast is going to last from 8 until 10. <laughs> Love popular decisions. Uh, so you can either sleep in or go for a moderate three to four mile hike at a reasonable hour. These two will lead. Um, they will meet you here at 8.30 or you can meet me at... Fowler, which is the gym, which is on Texas Avenue, right off of University, sort of across the street from St. Luke's, for yoga. If you brought a mat, bring your mat. Um, but there will be some available. Yoga is at 9, from 9 to 10.30. And then 11 o'clock, we'll have Gail Hockman. And let's see, anything I'm forgetting? Um, the Anna Stein sign-ups are now out at the end. So when you go late to breakfast tomorrow, don't forget to sign up for her. And Wyatt and Adam and Hastings both want to make announcements. So y'all can race here. Go first. All right, hand selection night. Adrian, will you pick a number one through 40 so we may give your book away? 33, 33 wonderful number. Clorinda Ross. Is Larry Bird 33? Yeah, I know. Steve, will you pick a number one through 40? Cindy Christian Rogers. All right, Wyatt. I've been meaning to say that all of these photographs from the first year of the Writers' Conference through the end of this one are by Miriam Berkeley, who's here on the front row. Every couple of years she gets a better camera, and I'll just warn you, be careful. Don't do anything bad. This has a telephoto lens or, or close to that. You're never safe. Be good. Uh, she also has photographs for sale. So if you like, well, we have the portraits. They're not for sale. We have these. Uh, she has these all around, and many of us have purchased them over the years, and they're wonderful. She's always bringing new ones. She usually puts them over there. So take a look, and thank you, Miriam. Yes, separate portfolio with some of the ones you see and others that are not framed. And now, someone that Garrison Keeler couldn't even give a fair estimate to, that shy yet fearful, uh, fearsome, I mean, man, <laughs> Steve Yarbrough. That was intentional why it said fearful because um, there's a running joke. Tony, Early, Tony Early's been telling me uh, ghost stories late at night and I've been sleeping with the light on the last couple of nights. <laughs> and he can scare the living hell out of you with those stories. Um, I want to thank Wyatt, first of all, for um, having me back again. Um, 
He means a lot to me. He was very kind to me when I was young and struggling. For about a year, he called me Mr. Fiction. And I started, that's how I started thinking of myself. Mr. Fiction. Um, but this is a special place, and um, if you're here for the first time, you may not have picked up on this yet, but a lot of us think of it as family. Uh, so it's a joy to be back. Thank you to the staff members. And also, my workshop partner, Jill. Um, I don't know how many hours we've spent together at the head of various tables, but it's always a joy. Uh, something special. My good friend Alice started the other day with the dark and then went to the light, and I'm going to reverse the process um, and, and just read a little bit of something that I, I hope is light before we get into some dark stuff. This is a, um, just a very short chapter um, from my recent novel, The Realm of Last Chances, which is about a couple moving from California to Massachusetts who, unlike my wife and me, um, do not instantly fall in love with the place. And so um, I'll read this brief section. I don't think there's anything you, you need to know other than that. In California, Cal had kept his distance from the neighbors. He knew the names of only two, Ann and Alex Neal, mortgage bankers in their 60s, who lived right next door on the other side of a redwood fence that he took it upon himself to maintain, replacing rotten boards and bearing all the cost. Because the Neals kept insisting they come over for a drink and get acquainted, Kristen finally prevailed on him to accompany her one Sunday afternoon, a year or so after they moved in. The two couples sat together in the living room, which displayed all the worst traits of 70s interior design. Green shag carpet, plaid wallpaper, a monstrous chandelier with transparent glass drops. Alex, it turned out, held strong views about Mexicans, a category that for him included everyone whose native language was Spanish, no matter their country of origin. <laughs> the ones I hired to do my yard, he said, only the head honcho speaks a word of English, and he can't understand half of what you tell him. He'll just stand there shuffling his feet and saying, see, sí, see. Sí. Problem is, he doesn't see. Sí. Last January, I dragged my Christmas tree outside, intending to pull it out of the stand, but the phone rang, so I ran in to answer it and got embroiled in a long conversation with a golfing buddy, and in the meantime, they showed up and lugged the whole thing off, stand and all. There's just something missing in the Mexican mind. By rights, he maintained, they'd rebuild Manzanar, where they'd pinned up the nips during World War II and incarcerate all the wetbacks there prior to deportation. Ann reached over, tousled his thick silver hair, and urged her new neighbors not to think too badly of him. He's been a fine husband and father, she said. He doesn't have a lot of ideas, but almost everyone he does have is wrong. <laughs> To withstand the ordeal, Cal had three or four drinks. When they got back home, he poured himself another. Kristen watched him from the sofa, sipping wine while he strode around the living room with his free hand slashing air. I'll never set foot in their house again, he seethed. So don't you try to make me. Who in his right mind would choose to waste the better part of an afternoon with assholes like that? There are better ways to kill time. You could listen to the Grateful Dead. You could oil the you could oil the door hinges or take a fucking nap. <laughs> as far as Kristen knew, he never spoke to Alex again, though she maintained she sometimes saw him talking to Ann near the mailbox. But when their neighbor was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and drugs senseless, Cal went to the hospice in Sacramento every day for a week to sit at his bedside. Ann told Kristen she walked in one time and found him holding her husband's hand. Now here he was on the far side of the continent and once again thinking of fences. He'd spent the last few minutes hoisting sacks of sand, gravel, and cement onto his shoulder and carrying them from the truck to the yard where he propped them against a stack of rails and posts 
And he had his garden hose hooked up and had grabbed the post hole digger when the guy who lived next door stuck his head over the rickety knee-high fence that would soon be replaced. Hey, he said, looks like you're getting ready to build something. Cal sighed. Later, thinking back on it, he guessed maybe he rolled his eyes. He'd been dreading the day when this guy would try to engage him. He was probably about 65, maybe a little older, a short, tanned man who wore glasses and had a carefully trimmed mustache. He drove a small white BMW SUV that looked like it had become what it was against its better judgment, but he rarely left home. His house had plenty of windows, and since he never closed the shutters, Cal couldn't help but notice that there were enormous flat-screen TVs in at least three rooms. Sometimes all of them would be going simultaneously. The Red Sox on one, the Patriots on another, Sean Hannity on the third. <laughs> he kept the volume so loud that you can often even hear them over the noise made by his window units, which still droned day and night, though it wasn't hot anymore. Yeah, Cal said, I'm getting ready to fence off the rest of our yard. We've got a dog who's tired of being cooped up inside. The neighbor stuck his hand out. Vincenzo, he said, but my friends, which I hope you're going to join the ranks of, call me Vico. Cal laid the post hole digger down, walked over to the fence, and shook his hand. Up close like that, he could see something white protruding from the man's ear. At first, he thought it was cotton, then realized it was a hearing aid. My name's Cal, he said loudly. <laughs> Cal, that's perfect. I noticed you came here from California. Yeah, we did, but Cal's not for California. It's short for Calvin. Like the guy that started the Methodist Church. I believe that was someone named Wesley. I'm Catholic. What do I know? Vico spread his arms wide, palms out, as if to acknowledge his ignorance. You like football? Not really. Baseball? Not especially. <laughs> Food and wine? He could see where this was going. Yeah, if they're good. Well, over at my house, if I do say so, they will be. I've been divorced for 30 years and cooked for myself every single day. I probably would have made a better wife than husband, except I'm 100% heterosexual. <laughs> or I was, anyhow, back when I had the necessary tools. He pointed at the BMW in the driveway. In there, I've got two cases of Barbera. Among some, it's got a bad name, but I buy good stuff. There's this little group of guys that get together every week or two, usually at my place, watch a game and eat and drink. They're coming tomorrow evening. Sox versus Yankees. I'll make a big pot of pasta. We'd love to have you join us. We could use some new blood. Any day now, one of us could bite the dust. It happens. <laughs> Cal tried to think of a good excuse, but couldn't come up with one. Well, he said, the truth is, I'm not real sociable. <laughs> For an instant, Vico's face froze as if in a fit of palsy. Then he laughed. None of us are socialists either, he said. <laughs> that's just a, mis to say, that's a mistaken notion a lot of people around the country hold about this state. Myself, I tend to vote Republican. But my buddies, they go the other way. Got an ex-cop in our group and a retired coach from Montville High, and both of them used to be in a union. I give them a little hell about that from time to time, and they give me hell right back. See, I'm a retired CPA, did their taxes year after year, so they know I know the score. Our cop buddy routinely, routinely, took home 140, 150, Pulls so much overtime, you wonder when he had a minute to eat or take a crap. You ever notice when there's road work, maybe a couple of public works guys patching a pothole, you see a pair of cops standing around in those slime green vests, slurping Duncan D and pretending to direct traffic? That generates overtime, and state law says you got to have them. But I don't call it socialism. I just call it two cops standing around getting paid for drinking coffee. Panic was starting to set in. 
a feeling of claustrophobia, of being caught out and observed and bent to the will of another. Listen, Cal told him, I need to dig some holes. It's supposed to rain tonight. See you tomorrow, Vico said, turning toward the BMW, which he'd spend the next few minutes unloading, toting boxes of wine, bags of groceries, and a pot of daffodils into his house. That's nice. Um, I like to say, and I do mean it, that I'm, that I'm working on uh, another book of stories. Um, my first three books were story collections and the next six were novels. The problem for me is I can write about two stories and then I can't think of any more for five years. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm halfway there, roughly, after 16 years of, of working on the next book of stories. Uh, so I'm going to read one tonight that I, I think the only thing you need to know is the story set in the late 90s uh, when it was actually written. Um, I doubt that anybody's seen it unless you keep your old issues of Shenandoah. You should have been over at the house earlier. Uh, my, my lovely, wonderful wife, the story set in Tuscany. It's called Tuscany Now. She was helping me with the Italian pronunciation, you know, like grabbing your mouth and saying, Chitlali! <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, this story's not funny, and if I try to do that, y'all are going to be laughing. Um, so this is called Tuscany Now. He paid the driver, giving him a generous tip because he'd actually enjoyed the circuitous trip from the railway station, which should have been only about three minutes away. In the time-honored fashion of Italian taxi drivers, the man had taken him all over town, passing the Duomo not once but twice, and actually crossing the Arno a couple of times as well, using Ponte Santa Trinita on both occasions. He picked up the suitcase and walked over to the door of number 12 via Chilea. The last button in the second row, Bissolati, the nameplate said. He rang and she buzzed him in. Someone had installed lamps on each of the landings, but for some reason only the first one came on. Except for a narrow shaft of light that squeezed in through the tiny window on the third floor landing, the upper reaches of the stairwell were dark. One, two, three, four, five steps up the final flight, two more steps to cross the landing. In the darkness, he set his suitcase down, straightened his jacket, and knocked. She wore a loose-fitting blouse and a taffeta skirt with a swirling pattern on it, lots of reds and greens and golds against a black background. She was taller than he had thought. Her hair was still dark. He did not believe she dyed it. It had just stayed that way. Her face had lines on it now, but not too many. Mr. Barrett? Miss Bizzolotti, I believe. She smiled and nodded, then stepped aside to let him in. The living room contained a couch, a small glass table, a television set, a stereo unit, a new one from the looks of it, stood on a shelf beside the window. A green curtain hung across the entry to the bedroom. He let his head swivel slightly until he saw the stairs leading to the loft. There's a futon up there. I didn't make it down. The agency said there would be only the one guest. That's right. There's a desk up there too. You may use it if you like, though it gets warm in the afternoon. That's why I keep shade, a shade on the skylight. Her use of the singular pronoun did not escape him. She showed him around the apartment, leading him into the bedroom, where she opened the big cedar wardrobe and exposed a large collection of towels and bed linen. Stooping, she pulled the remote control from its resting place under the bed. This is for the ceiling fan, she said. It's the opposite of what you might expect. One is high, four is low. She walked him through the operation of various kitchen appliances, showing him how to light the stove and use the knife sharpener should he need to. 
Coffee is in this cabinet, she said, opening a door and pointing at a tall can. Use what you like, but please replenish. She swept aside a curtain that hid the compartment under the sink. Extra light bulbs, soap. In the bathroom, she warned him against putting too much paper down the toilet. If it becomes clogged, which sometimes happens, contact me and I'll send someone. He followed her back into the living room where she pointed out the telephone. It hung on the wall beside the window. It's unplugged, she said, to keep you from being bothered by calls that might be intended for me. The connection is behind the TV. Use it if you need to, but please keep track of any calls you might make. She handed him a small slip of paper on which she had written her phone number. You may ring me here if you need to. Otherwise, I'll see you next Saturday morning. Gracias. She laughed at his Italian and tossed her hair. And when she did that, he saw a few streaks of gray among the roots. You are prepared for Italy? She said. Oh, he said, I don't know about that. I don't know that you could say that at all. When she had left, he threw his jacket on the couch, carried his suitcase into the bedroom, and laid it down on the floor. He opened it and removed the bottle of Bushmills he had bought in the duty-free shop in San Francisco. He had pulled the bottle from its plastic sack and stuffed it into the suitcase after he had landed in Milan. And though he dropped the suitcase once on the train to Florence, the bottle was still intact. He took it into the kitchen, sat down at the table, and poured himself a drink. It was late afternoon now and starting to get really hot, as it does in Florence in June when there's, when there's no breeze. The odor of exhaust hung in the air, overwhelming whatever more pleasant odors might have been there. He sipped the whiskey, listening to the sounds of the city, children crying in a house across the street, somebody operating a jackhammer a block or two away. When he'd finished the drink, he stood the glass in the sink and returned to the bedroom. The envelope was at the bottom of his suitcase under a pair of jeans. He pulled it out. He promised himself he wouldn't open it, but the old temptation returned, and for an instant he was on the verge of raising the clasp and pulling up the flap. If he'd done that, though, there really would have been no point in coming here. Carrying the envelope, he walked into the living room and climbed the stairs to the loft. In a corner of the loft stood a cabinet. It was about five feet tall, made of plywood that had been finished with some kind of cheap wood veneer. It had two doors, from each of which protruded a large round knob. Several rubber bands had been wrapped around both knobs to keep the doors shut. One by one, he removed the rubber bands. Finally, the door swung open. Inside the cabinet, there were five shelves. Old clothes lay on some of them. There were two or three paint cans in there, a paintbrush, some screwdrivers, a mousetrap, a deflated soccer ball, a porcelain doll with a missing foot. On the middle shelf lay 10 or 12 big scrapbooks piled up in two stacks. Most of the albums were brown or black. The one that caught his eye was the red one that lay at the bottom of the stack on the right. He pulled it out a few inches. Lifting up on the one above it, he pushed the envelope in so that it rested between the red scrapbook and the one on top. He shoved the red one back in, then closed the doors and replaced the rubber bands. When he'd finished, he was soaked with sweat. He pulled his shirt off, tossed it over the railing, and watched it land on the floor below. He walked over to the futon and sat down and closed his eyes. On Mondays in spring and summer, when she lived across the river, she always rose early and went to Mercato Centrale. She liked to get her shopping done at the beginning of the week because for her this was a busy time of year. She existed by and large off the rental money the agency sent her and the money she made doing charcoal sketches of tourists. She set her easel up in a corner of Piazza della Signoria close to the Uffizi. 
She usually took Dana along on her shopping trips, but lately the dog, a Dalmatian who was almost 13 now, had been having trouble completing the walk. She had once lain down in the middle of Ponte Vecchio, and there had been nothing to do but phone a taxi. Elsa gave her a bowl of fresh water now, told her she'd be back in a couple of hours, and Canvas, tote bag in hand, set off for the market. She bought coffee, some gorgonzola, several bags of pasta, then went upstairs and loaded up on fresh vegetables. She ate very little meat, had eaten very little for many years. The habit was a carryover from her time with Valentina. They had occasionally quarreled about her eating habits, her preference for lamb kidneys and beef braised in milk, and in the end, and this is in so many other things, Valentina had prevailed. Weighed down by the heavy bag, she started back. She hadn't gone too far before she began to perspire heavily. She was getting too old to lug heavy bags from one side of town to the other. She knew that eventually, during the six months or so each year that she spent at Valentina's, she'd have to start shopping close by. When she got back to the flat, the phone was ringing. Still clutching the tote bag, she grabbed the receiver and said hello. The person on the other end cleared his throat. Ms. Bissolotti? It was her renter. Silently, she prayed that none of the appliances was acting up. Two weeks ago, while a Canadian family was staying there, the washing machine had quit. Replacing the timer had cost her 220,000 lira. Yes, she said. It's Ray Barrett. I'm the one who's staying at your place. Yes. Well, he said and fell silent. She set her tote bag down. What is it, she said. Is there a problem with the toilet? The toilet? Oh, no. The toilet's great. I mean, the toilet's working fine, flushing really nicely. <laughs> I've been doing what you said. I only put one sheet of paper in there at a time. <laughs> you may put more than one sheet in. <laughs> so far, I haven't needed to, but if I do, I will. Perhaps because of all the nude statuary, the city seemed to draw crazy people like flies. No small number of the weird ones had stayed at her place. Once, when the drain in the kitchen sink backed up, a plumber had removed more than 50 condoms from the pipes. Another time, cleaning under the bed, she had found a bunch of clay body parts, fingers, toes, a nose, and a kneecap, that a very bad sculptor had apparently discarded. They had left things that didn't belong there, and they had taken things that did. Was there something you wanted? She said. I don't know my way around here. I wondered, would you want to go to dinner maybe? She'd had several invitations from the Redders. It happened more times than one might think. She'd never said yes, and she didn't say yes now. She told him she was sorry, but this was a busy time of the year for her, and while she would have liked to go to dinner, she really wouldn't be able to make it. He said, oh well, maybe our paths will cross around town. He spent the afternoon sitting on a marble bench in the Medici Chapel. It was cool there, and despite all the tourists, many of whom were Americans, it was quiet. The building inspired reverence, hushed voices. There was a picture at home. It showed him sitting on the same bench, his hair sandy, not gray, his mouth slightly agape as he stares, apparently transfixed, at something out of the frame. He's wearing khaki shorts, a green t-shirt, and on the floor beside his right foot, there's a backpack. You can tell, in other words, that he's a tourist, and you assume, once you know where the photo was taken, that he's been struck dumb by the sheer magnitude of Michelangelo's vision. You would not think, not for a moment, that here in the quiet of these magenta walls, he's hearing a voice, one that is anything but hushed. The voice is warning him that because he'd neglected to flush a urinal in the bathroom at the Trattoria where he ate lunch, he's going to receive a phone call tonight. One which will inform him that his home in California is gone now, consumed by natural forces. 
You would never suspect that a moment or two after the photo was taken, he would rise and without remembering to pick up his backpack or tell the person who took the photo that he was leaving, he'd hurry outside, away from the chapel, back to Via Dante Alighieri, where he believed, mistakenly, that the trattoria was located. The child's mother was a skinny, tall, blonde woman whose hair had been teased into a peak that bore an amazing resemblance to the Matterhorn. <laughs> Creating a caricature of her might have been enjoyable, but instead Elsa had to draw a portrait of the daughter. She was a chubby-cheeked nine or ten-year-old who looked as if she had never smiled. She sat on the camp stool, feet spread apart, plump hands gripping her knees, the very picture of truculence and spite. What part of America do you live in? Elsa asked the girl, sketching the outline of her face. Georgia. It gets hot there, doesn't it? Not like here. Here it's stinky hot. Her mother said, Vicky? Well, it is stinky hot, Mama. You said so yourself. You said it was stinky hot, and you said that the folks themselves shut up, her mother said. <laughs> The urge to depict the little girl wearing the conical hat of a witch was not easily dismissed. <laughs> Elsa finished the drawing in silence. It was not particularly good, but the mother expressed pleasure. She did three more jobs, including a portrait of an elderly Pole who told her he was one of his country's most important poets. When she finished with him, he offered her a bottle of vodka as payment, but she politely declined, requesting lira instead. By then it was six o'clock and she was tired, so tired she knew anything, she, anything else she did today would not meet the standards she still tried to set for herself. The pictures she drew might end up in ugly frames. They might hang on the wall beside photos of relatives in places like Gdansk and Atlanta. But each one of them had her name on it, so she always did her best. She closed her pad and laid it on the leather case she carried her materials in. She reached for the easel to fold it. A voice said, I'd love to have you do one of me. He'd been to the Uffizi, he told her. The wait had not been bad, 30 minutes, 35 at the most. He wore gray shorts now and a loose-fitting red pullover. An international herald was tucked under his arm. He carried a plastic bag that contained two oranges. I told you our paths might cross, he said. Before she could reply, the roar of engines split the air. Two carabinieri on motorcycles spun into a crowd of Senegalese traders who had arrayed their wares about 20 meters away in the area between the two wings of the Uffizi. The carabinieri smashed into the traders' tables, overturning them, crunching their collection of cheap trinkets and poor reproductions. The traders scattered, laughing, slapping their thighs, making good-natured faces at the policemen who glared at them for a moment or two before revving their engines, wheeling around and flashing off into the Piazza della Signoria. With the rolled-up paper, he shaded his eyes. That's happened before, I guess. It happens every day. I don't even notice it anymore. The traders were scrambling around, salvaging whatever had not been broken, pulling new items out of their bags, riding the overturned tables. They don't have licenses, she said. Well, you can't do anything without a license, can you? Not here. Not anywhere, I guess. He continued to stand there. Reluctantly, she removed her sketch pad from the carrying case and stood it on the easel. All right, she said. Please sit down. For a moment or two, her hands did not move. Sitting in her chair, she stared at him. His own fingers drummed his knees. He said, there are quite a few imperfections on display here, I'm afraid. In Florence? No, in my face. Certainly not in Florence. He waved his hand, intending the gesture to encompass all of the city. Though any passerby who noticed would have thought he was motioning at the copy of Michelangelo's David, which stood just a few feet away. Florence is a city of perfection. I suppose that depends, she said, upon one's definition of perfection. How would you define it? 
She was sketching now, her eyes still on him rather than the pad. As I would define it, she said, it doesn't exist. Not even here? Not even here. That statue of David you're looking at now? You're aware that it's a copy. He nodded. Have you seen the original? Yes. On the original, the arms are too long. I didn't know that, he lied. So it's imperfect. On the copy over there, the arms are just the right length. But since it's a copy of an imperfect work, perfection is not called for. She smiled, then not at him. Therefore, it too is imperfect. What if the arms on the copy had been exactly as long as the arms on the original? Would you call it perfect then? No, because the original itself was imperfect. She wrinkled her nose. For a moment, he thought she might laugh, and he wanted her to. Wanted it worse than he had wanted anything in a long time. But it didn't happen. She merely sniffled, as if she had a slight cold. You see, she said, I will simply define perfection right out of existence. And why is that? Because I think it's dangerous to believe in it. Is it dangerous to strive for it? Not as long as you know that since it doesn't exist, it can't be attained. Once or twice while she drew, she swiped a stray strand of hair from her forehead. Moisture beads had appeared on her cheeks. Her blouse, the same one she had worn the other day, clung to her shoulders. He imagined how it would feel to touch that damp skin, to run his hands over her slick breasts and shoulders. Finished, she stared for a moment at the result, then looked from the picture to him. Her gaze narrowed as she searched his face. Something new appeared in her eyes. Then, so quickly, he almost convinced himself it had never been there, it disappeared. Well, she said, what do you think? She showed him the drawing. No one who knew him would ever mistake the picture for his likeness. The brows were far too heavy, the lips too thin. The eyes were small and to his mind beady. There was something sinister about the overall effect. It looked as if it belonged on the bulletin board in a precinct office. <laughs> I like it, he said. <laughs> it's really me. He had stood, but she remained seated. She held the picture, looking up at him, waiting as he withdrew his wallet. The sign beside her easel said the price for a portrait was 25,000 lira. He offered her a 100,000 note. She didn't take it. I don't think I have that much change, she said. You don't need change. The rest is a tip. I can't take that. It's far too much. Please, in the interest of Florentine-American friendship. <laughs> Slowly, still looking at him, she tucked the bill into the pocket of her blouse. She rolled the portrait into a cylinder, secured it with a rubber band, and handed it to him. He thanked her for doing such a great job, told her good evening, and set off across the piazza. The agency, Tuscan Holidays Incorporated, was based in New York. These days, from what she knew, most of their bookings were done via the internet. A friend who owned a computer had shown her the agency's webpage. Above a strikingly colorful photo of a castle in the hills near Siena, an emerald legend appeared, come to Tuscany now. Elsa had been renting her apartment through the agency for almost 20 years. It had been Valentina's idea. Valentina had traveled, she'd been many places, including New York, where she had met a graduate of art history at Columbia University. The woman had been to Florence herself, and she told Valentina about the agency. You could make a lot of money renting your apartment, she had said, provided it's centrally located. Valentina's apartment was not centrally located, but Elsa's was. And Valentina had pointed out that since they were living together anyway, there was no reason why they couldn't rent Elsa's place, at least during the height of tourist season. 
Elsa had been reluctant, but Valentina was two years older. She'd actually been Elsa's tutor at one time. So in the end, she had her way. From the very beginning, that day back in 1981, when they showed the apartment to the agency's representative who was in Tuscany scouting properties, they had understood that there were several ground rules. First, the apartment had to be spotless and everything in it had to be in good working order. If anything failed, they would have to repair it instantly and at their own expense. Second, the apartment must be available for rent 365 days a year, though in practice there would be few rentals from the end of December through the beginning of May. Third, when the apartment was occupied by renters, the owners were never under any circumstances to enter the property without being requested to do so either by the agency or by the tenants themselves. Failure to adhere to these ground rules would result in the termination of their contract with the agency. She knew that going inside the apartment on Via Chilea was dangerous, at least in the financial sense and perhaps in other ways as well. Nevertheless, having slept only two hours the night before, she was at the cafe Tuesday morning when it opened. She ordered coffee and took a seat by the window. From there, she achieved a clear view of her own building. Her stomach was already churning from anxiety and lack of sleep, and the coffee did nothing to help it. Perspiration streamed down her back, her hands shook. Every time the door opened, her pulse raced, and every time someone else stepped out, she wanted to lay her head on the table and cry. She hoped he would leave. He had to. If he didn't come out soon, she would barge right in. Finally, he appeared. He stood there on the sidewalk, put his hands in his pockets, glanced one way, then the other, almost as if he understood she was watching and meant to tease her, though in reality she knew he was trying to make up his mind which sight he wanted to see next. He was, after all, a sightseer. He started off at a leisurely pace, hands still in his pockets. She made herself count to 50, then rose. She took the steps fast. By the time she reached the top floor, she was heaving. She paused, leaning on the banister. Her head felt light, yellow spots spun around her. She steadied herself and pulled out the key. They were there, right where she had known they would be. She held the ragged envelope but didn't open it. She could feel the stack of photos through the yellowed paper. And she knew, as surely as she had ever known anything, that he had returned every one of them. What she didn't know and couldn't imagine was why. Inside the Duomo, staring with renewed wonder at Brunelleschi's dome, showered in natural light, he hears himself tell a story. The people who were in charge of building this place hired a guy named Arnolfo to do it. He got as far as this part right here, it's called the Tribune, before he died. He left them a tough problem, which was how to build a roof over something so big. For about 100 years, nobody could figure it out. One person wanted to fill it up with a big mound of dirt that had gold coins buried in it. The dirt would support the roof, and then after the roof had been built, people would be allowed to come inside and dig around for the gold, and in the process, free of charge, they'd cart out the dirt, and leave the roof standing. <laughs> the rulers didn't go for that. Instead, they staged a competition. And this young fellow named Brunelleschi convinced them that whoever could make an egg stand upright on a marble tabletop was the man for the job. You know how he did it? Blonde bangs slide off her forehead. Her blue eyes wait an answer. He waited until everybody else had failed, and then he took the egg, and he hit the shell one time on the marble, whap, just like that, and he set the egg down, and it stood. And that's more or less what he did in here. He put a roof on this place with what's called a double cupola, which is really just one shell supported by a second shell. That helps to spread out the weight. The dome is still standing. The girl is long gone. She hadn't bothered to lock the door. It swung open as soon as he touched the handle. 
He didn't even consider the possibility that someone had broken in, that the notorious criminals everyone claimed you'd encounter in Italy if you stayed long enough had ransacked his luggage. He knew it was her. He stepped lightly over the threshold. Gently, he closed the door behind him. She was sitting in the kitchen at the far end of the table. July of 1984, she said. That's when you stayed here? He walked over to the table, looked at the chair as if to ask whether or not he could sit. She nodded. He pulled it out and sat down. Actually, he said, it was the last week in June. You and your wife and a little girl, I guess. The little girl was blonde, and if I remember right, your wife's hair was very dark. He didn't say anything. He couldn't. His throat felt constricted as if he'd swallowed a large chunk of ice. She banged the table. Help me, damn it, she said. I want to remember. It was like listening to a tape of yourself. The voice was and was not his own. It sounded processed, electronic. Her hair was about as dark as yours. She was medium height, very slim. You had trouble understanding her, I imagine, partly because she was born in Tennessee and she spoke with a fairly strong accent and partly because she was having bad allergies at the time and she kept sniffling. A couple of times that first day she asked you where something was and you just kind of looked at her blankly and I had to ask you. You seemed to understand me fine. I don't understand you at all. I meant back then. She stood and walked over to the counter. She opened the cabinet, pulled out a bottle of liqueur and a small glass and came back to the table. She poured the glass full, started to lift it, then seemed to think better of it. She went back to the cabinet, pulled out another glass, brought it back to the table and poured it full too. She placed it on the table in front of him. Still standing, she took a sip of hers. Then she set the glass down. She reached over and slapped his face so hard the back of his head hit the wall. His eyes stung, but he didn't close them. He picked his glass up and drank the liqueur. It burned going down. Would you like another one? She said. A slap or a drink? She could tell from the way he said it that if she replied a slap, he would just nod. She picked her glass up, walked back to her chair, and sat down. From the far end of the table, he watched her, waiting. The flesh on his nose and under his eyes was bright red now. She'd really hit him good. Her hand was still tingling. She let her palm rest on the envelope. I didn't miss these she said, for close to five months. Do you want to know why I missed them then? All he could do was bow his head. It was going to be worse than he had expected, even worse than he'd feared, and his fears, nurtured all these years, had not been mild ones. It's not that I want to know why you miss them, he said. I need to know. I need to hear everything you ever thought you'd say to whoever took that envelope assuming you ever met the person. This discussion is really not about your needs. A drop or two of liqueur remained in her glass. She finished it off and poured herself another. She stared at the liqueur for a moment or two then decided not to drink it. The other woman in those photos, she said, was named Valentina. She was an unusual person. For one thing, she was very beautiful, almost too beautiful. She was also a difficult person. She had a very strong will, but not strong enough to keep herself from drinking too much and from experimenting with various drugs. Also, though she possessed what many people of influence considered great talent, she didn't pursue her work as she should have, and this caused her much personal unhappiness. On September 23, 1984, she jumped off Ponte Santa Trinita. She was still alive when they pulled her out of the Arno, but she died within the hour. 
Looking back, I would not say that she treated me well, but I've never felt I could love anyone else. I didn't look for those pictures until several months after she died. When I did look for them, they weren't there. For the longest time, I was convinced that Valentina herself had destroyed them. I hated her for that. But gradually, I concluded that she would not have done it because if there was one thing Valentina loved, it was her own image. Not herself, just her image. When I realized that she could not have done it, I tried to think who could have. Off and on for years, I've seen the faces of the tenants who lived here in the spring and summer of that year. I could not remember your name and my recollection of your features was skewed over time. But I must tell you that for some reason, I always believed you were the one who had taken them. I can't imagine how or why anyone would do a thing like that. But I will ask you to tell me, and I will ask you right before I put you out of my apartment to tell me why you brought them back. He had come to hear those questions and to answer them. And for a long time, as he imagined this moment, he had believed he knew exactly what he would say. He would tell her that when he came here the last time, he was in bad trouble. He had made a couple of mistakes, he would say, mistakes at work that cost his employers a lot of money. He had become terrified of making more. Though not a religious person, he had begun to hear a voice in his head that he quickly became convinced belonged to a being which was omniscient, if not omnipotent. At first, it addressed matters of obvious import. One night, at a cookout, it warned him not to embrace the wife of a friend after she kissed him and told him she thought he was the kindest man she knew. It urged him to fully report his income to the IRS, reminding him that those who believed in social programs, as he did, should not attempt to cheat the government, even if they believed they could get away with it. Then the voice began to act like a candidate for public office. It ventured an opinion about everything. When he picked up the morning paper, intent on reading the sports, the voice would warn him that he should turn to the local news first. If he started to grab a half gallon of chocolate ice cream at the grocery, the voice would bully him into buying vanilla. He had found the envelope in the first place because he'd ignored the voice. You used to have a lamp on the wall, behind the couch, he thought he would say. It was red, just a small reading lamp mounted on some, some kind of brass plate. He was about to reach for it one day and turn it on when a voice said not to. He did it anyway. The lamp fell off the wall. He climbed the stairs looking for a screwdriver. He thought he might find one in the cabinet in the loft. My daughter was lying up there on the futon reading, he would say. She was eight at the time and she loved to read, loved it more than anything. She paid me no attention when I squatted before the cabinet and pulled off those rubber bands. I don't know why I picked up the envelope and I don't know why I opened it. But when I saw what was inside, I couldn't put it back. My wife and I, Hadn't touched each other for months. She loved me, but I'd almost driven her crazy. Your friend was beautiful, but you were the one who entranced me. She was so perfect, she didn't seem real. Your beauty was natural, and back then, beauty was something I still loved. He had intended to say all that and more. Instead, in his confusion, he picked up the story very close to the end. Even if I hadn't ignored the voice and tucked that envelope away inside my shirt so that my daughter couldn't see it when I went past her, I'm sure that when we got back home, if we'd all gotten home, I mean, my wife would have left me anyway. It wasn't my tucking the envelope that caused the accident, it was my driving. I should never have been behind the wheel over here. I couldn't handle the speeds people drive at. Of course, the voice had warned me about that too. I'd always known that one day I would bring the envelope back to you, he said. I should have done it sooner. It's just that even though I haven't opened it in many, many years, having it gave me a purpose. It left me one last mistake I could try and rectify. 
She stood by and watched until he had gathered all his things and put them in his suitcase. Then, without letting her eyes off him, she found a taxi to take him to a hotel. He thanked her and told her goodbye. Though she did not fully understand why she was doing it, she followed him out onto the landing. As if it were a normal thing, he accepted her decision to go downstairs with him. There used to be a little store down here on the right, he said, as they descended, run by a guy and his wife. I notice it's gone now. What happened? They have a stall in Mercado Centrale. I buy from them occasionally. They're doing quite well now, I think. That's a relief. They were nice to me back then. I bought bottled water from them every morning. The man could speak a little English. He told me I should come back sometime in the fall. He described for me as best he could what the Tuscan Hills would look like in October. The last day we were here, he gave my daughter an orange. At the foot of the stairs, she pushed open the door. He stepped through it, then held it open so she could follow if she chose. She did. The air smelled like diesel. It was hot now, the hottest it had been this year. Heat waves rose off the pavement. Together, they waited on the narrow sidewalk. She supposed that anyone who happened to notice them might well think she was his wife, that she'd come down to the street to bid him goodbye before he took off on a business trip to Rome or Milan. You wouldn't know, just by looking at them, that the absence of others was what had bound them together for these few moments. You wouldn't know that by returning to Florence to right an old wrong, he'd left both of them even less to live on. Beneath the weight of late afternoon traffic, the bridge quivers. Gazing out over the water, he recalls a bit of information he once possessed. He doesn't know where he came across it, though he does remember when. The bridge, which had been destroyed by a flood, was rebuilt at the behest of Cosimo I by an architect named Aminati. In its redesigned form, it came to be considered the prettiest bridge in Florence. For hundreds of years, it withstood everything nature threw its way, only to be destroyed again by the German army during the Second World War. This time, when it was being rebuilt using Aminati's plans, a group of scholars and art critics began to wonder about the most obvious feature of the bridge, its three curved arches. It would appear that they had been drawn freehand, but it was a well-known fact that Aminati, while a magnificent architect, possessed no particular skill for linear design. Finally, someone found the prototype for the curves and the sarcophagi Michelangelo had designed for the Medici tombs. Viewed from Ponte Santa Trinita at sunset, the Arno shimmers like a river of gold. Thank you all.